Uh, as you have seen from the uh, agenda, uh, we do have a Cracker Jack roster of speakers, um, including uh, on this first panel two people with an international reputation on uh, these issues that we're going to consider today. We are going to go until 2.30 for this panel, then we will m move directly into the next panel without any sort of break, hear from the ambassador uh, of Afghanistan. Um, after his comments and after an opportunity for us to engage in some Q&A and some dialogue with the ambassador, we will then take a brief break. There'll be coffee and tea and perhaps cookies um, immediately outside this room. Uh, but I would encourage you um, to view it as a brief opportunity to stretch your legs and get a cup of coffee rather than as an extended break because we will want to get started again by 345 so that we can let everyone out of here at a decent time at the end of the evening. Um, so that's our mode of attack for the afternoon. Uh, again, Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. We're delighted to have you. Uh, I expect, uh, based upon the RSVP uh, list, uh, we're going to have an overflow room, and so I congratulate you on having the good sense uh, to get here early so you get a seat in this room rather than in the overflow room in another part of the building. Now, with those uh, business matters out of the way, let's go straight to uh, our first panel. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have, uh, as I said, two of the top people on Afghanistan uh, with us in this first panel. Uh, Dr. William Malley is professor and foundation director of the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy, Australian National University in Canberra. Um, he is trained as a political scientist, uh, has a PhD in politics from the University of New South Wales. Um, he has uh, an extraordinarily uh, impressive publication record. Uh, I'm not going to uh, even begin to list all his publications, uh, but I will mention just a couple of his more recent books on Afghanistan. He is the author in 2002 of The Afghanistan Wars, plural, unfortunately. Uh, four years before that, he published Fundamentalism Reborn, Afghanistan and the Taliban, um, and other books as well uh, on Afghanistan. Um, our second speaker for this panel um, is an anthropologist, uh, equally distinguished. Uh, Thomas Bearfield is professor of anthropology and chairman of the department uh, at Boston University. Um, his PhD is from Harvard. Um, he has focused uh, much of his work, his research, and his published work on contemporary and historical nomadic peoples of Eurasia. Um, he has done extensive field work uh, in Afghanistan as well as other parts of Central Asia. Uh, he too is the author of numerous publications, uh, including uh, Afghanistan and Atlas of Indigenous Domestic Architecture, published by the University of Texas, um, and the recipient of uh, distinguished awards. We're delighted to have both these uh, eminent authorities with us today. We've asked each to speak for roughly 20 minutes, after which time we'll give you uh, an opportunity to bounce ideas and ask questions uh, of them. So, uh, without further ado, we'll turn things over to William Malley. Thank you, Bob. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at the Woodrow Wilson Center and to have an opportunity to make some remarks on the situation in Afghanistan, which is, in some respects, encouraging, in other respects, troubling. And one of the reasons that uh, Afghanistan is always an interesting country to analyze is that, as Bob uh, remarked in his opening observations, it is a country which locates itself in a number of different regions of the world. It is both a part of Asia, part of the Middle East, and that, in a sense, has been one of its curses in that too often it has slipped down a crack between the two and not received 
uh, in its own measure the attention which it deserves. Uh, and I'd like to try and fill that gap to some extent in these remarks, firstly by making some comments about the paths that have led to the uh, situation uh, in Afghanistan at the moment since all political transition is path dependent, and then, then go on to talk about some of the specific challenges to political transition uh, to which one can point in the present situation. Now, one could hardly describe the circumstances leading up to the Bonn Agreement of December 2001 as even remotely propitious. Afghanistan has experienced uh, nearly a quarter of a century of serious disruption, it, encompassing, among other things, the substantial collapse of the instrumentalities of the state. And this can hardly be overemphasised, because too often in the past, particularly in the 1990s, the temptation for those uh, attempting to promote the restoration of political order was to see it in terms of uh, reconstituting a group of people who could be considered to be the government of Afghanistan, whereas the deeper challenge was that of addressing the problem of institutional decay reflected in the breakdown from the late 1970s onwards of the ability of the Afghan state to raise revenue of its own to fund the activities of the state and thereafter to engage in the kind of redistributive and constructive activities that one normally associates with the state as an institution. Beyond the collapse of the state, Afghanistan has also been inflicted by, uh, afflicted by deep uh, fissures within the political elite. And since uh, at least 1978, the challenge of trying to redevelop norms of civility to bind the behaviour of the political elite has been a fundamental one, uh, and it's one to which uh, Afghan elites have not really had much opportunity to rise. It's also the case that the collapse of the state and the fragmentation of the elite then set the scene for the emergence of significant armed militias, particularly after 1992, some uh, a product of the mobilisation of resistance against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan from the time of the invasion in December 1979, but some reflecting um, a more economic agenda of extractive and predatory warlordism. And allied with all these problems uh, was uh, the overarching challenge posed by the openness of Afghanistan's borders to manipulation by neighbouring countries. Indeed, it's not going too far to suggest that, uh, in the 1990s at least, Afghanistan was exposed to the threat of a creeping invasion by <coughs> forces operating from Pakistan, which fundamentally compromised uh, the integrity of such processes as were being used to try and bring elements of the uh, political elite together. So all in all, one is talking about a pre-December 2001 scenario which is far from encouraging, which conf would confront any individuals attempting to manage political transition in Afghanistan with deep and profound challenges uh, to which political science has no easy solutions. Since the Bonn Agreement of December 2001, there have been a number of notable achievements in Afghanistan, and I wouldn't want to downplay these. The holding of the emergency lawyer jirga in um, June 2002, and the constitutional lawyer jirga in December 2003 and January 2004. The drafting and then the adoption of a new constitution. Uh, conferences in Tokyo in uh, January 2002 and in Berlin in March, 2000, uh, March and April 2004 and the deployment, at least to Kabul, of the International Security Assistance Force, together with the commencement of security sector reform to address the long-term need uh, to reconstitute uh, a legitimate Afghan national army that could meet the fundamental Viberian requirement of constituting a monopoly of the state over the exercise of the legitimate means of violence. Uh, and I have no doubt that these will uh, receive further attention during the discussion today, as rightly they should. But as pays uh, a political scientist, I think it's also appropriate to identify the very serious challenges to political transition which remain in Afghanistan uh, and which haunt all the uh, positive elements of the transition process and still have the capacity substantially to undermine what has been achieved to this point. The next stage in the formal uh, transition traced out by the Bonn Agreement of 2001 
is the holding of elections, which are currently scheduled for September 2004. And to hold <coughs> elections in Afghanistan in anything like the current circumstances constitutes a huge challenge for a number of different reasons. Firstly, elections are divisive institutions. Elections involve the creating of a situation in which some are winners and others are losers. And to maintain, as for example the UN Secretary General did some years ago after a popular consultation in East Timor, uh, that uh, there are no winners and no losers is an attempt to deny the obvious. And the divisive character of elections in general can be ameliorated in consolidated democratic societies by a framework of norms and rules and expectations that ensure that the results stick, that the losers accept that they are losers on this occasion because they believe that they will nonetheless have a realistic opportunity in the future to contest elections again and be winners. But without such a framework of rules, elections can be seen by participants as a once-only opportunity to secure power, which means that there can be a temptation for losers to act as spoilers uh, in a destructive fashion, which I'll mention in just a moment. It's also the case that holding elections is perhaps the most logistically complex activity in which a society can engage in peacetime, particularly because it is now the case that exacting international standards have developed for freedom and fairness in electoral circumstances, which observers will be on hand to monitor. Uh, it's necessary for elections, uh, if they are to be free and fair, to mobilise large portions of an adult population in a secure environment uh, to express their views freely uh, with uh, high levels of security also for voting material, for blank ballot papers, for marked ballot papers, for the conduct of the count. And this is demanding even in uh, developed societies such as the United States. Uh, it is far more demanding a challenge in uh, a country which faces huge uh, infrastructural inadequacies uh, and in which it is uh, highly likely that forces may see queuing voters not as a manifestation of democracy at work, but as a soft target open to attack. Uh, and this highlights the third challenge of holding elections, namely to maintain security for voters. Uh, elections, unfortunately, are almost tailor-made for spoilers to intervene. Uh, I was an observer at the Cambodian election in 1993, and it was a near miracle that the Khmer Rouge uh, underestimated their capacity to uh, spoil those particular elections. Uh, it's, it's actually very easy to do. All one needs is a few people with grenades or sexual charges attacking queues of vulnerable voters and a process uh, in which people embark with a great degree of optimism can go down in a screaming heap. The message here is that Afghanistan is about to embark in one of the most, on one of the most challenging elements of a process of uh, democratisation uh, and there needs to be a very high level of commitment from the wider world to sustain uh, Afghanistan through this very difficult period, otherwise uh, all that has been achieved at this point may be put at risk. Now if this is the most imminent challenge which Afghanistan faces in its transition, there are six others which I'll briefly mention which I think are uh, uh, underlying uh, challenges of, of real seriousness. Uh, and they all have the potential to block the path towards the consolidation of uh, democratic institutions. The first is the ongoing challenge of state building, uh, making the new constitutional system work, which can be difficult if one has a multi-ethnic society but a presidential system where many ethnic groups may regard themselves as losers at the uh, conclusion of a presidential election. Uh, it's a challenge because of uh, administrative dysfunctionalities. Afghanistan has far too many ministries at the moment, ministries which are in place not because there's actually a functional requirement for so many ministries, but because there was a need for jobs to hand out to different political factions taking part in the Bonn conference. And it's also the case that some of the uh, unfortunate features of bureaucracy from the 1960s and the 1970s have resurfaced uh, 
particularly nepotism, uh, which uh, led the current finance minister, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, once to describe the, the old Afghan bureaucracy as the most corrupt on the face of the earth, uh, and which uh, has the capacity to thwart the efforts of a new administration to build its legitimacy in the eyes of ordinary people. A second challenge is the challenge of reconstituting trust. When one has had something like 25 years of conflict, one tends to find a society marked by multiple lines of distrust. Now, this is actually perfectly rational. Uh, when um, one is confronted by a history of bloodshed and mayhem, uh, it becomes quite normal for people to uh, become trusting only in circumstances in which uh, the costs of misplaced trust are likely to be low. Where the costs of misplaced trust are likely to be high, people tend to be very wary of other people and unwilling to cooperate with them, and certainly unwilling to uh, shed arms which they may see as necessary to protect them against a preemptive strike from other political actors. Uh, now, one could spend hours talking about the different specific points of distrust within Afghanistan, but one which has surfaced rather dramatically since the constitutional lawyer, Jirga, is one between, uh, on the one hand, technocrats who have returned to Afghanistan in recent times and who in many respects have skills which are vital for the uh, reconstitution of a working um, polity and administration. And on the other hand, people who were involved in combat against the Soviet forces and then against the Taliban, uh, who regard their own activities as having legitimated their role in the political system. And managing the tension that has surfaced between these two different groups uh, is uh, a fundamental challenge not just for Afghans, but for all who are well disposed towards them. A third challenge, some would say this is the greatest, is that of, of establishing security. Very regrettably, uh, when the International Security Assistance Force was deployed in Afghanistan, it was not uh, expanded beyond the Kabul area, and a great deal of positive momentum which had been built up by the Bonn process was uh, then dissipated. Uh, an attempt has been made to address the security issue through two other channels, the deployment of pr provincial reconstruction teams and the reconstitution of the Afghan National Army. But neither of these actually addresses the problem of ambient security. Provincial reconstruction <coughs> teams can provide little local guarantees of security and confidence, but they don't address the issue of security more generally. And uh, the difficulty of rebuilding the Afghan National Army is simply a long-term difficulty of of institution building, that one cannot build armies overnight. It's one thing to put people through basic training. Uh, it's another thing entirely to ensure that when the crunch comes, the loyalty of newly trained units will be to the uh, uh, dictates of civilian authorities rather than to other bases of loyalty which may be salient within a particular society. And we only have to look at the reports in the Washington Post last week of uh, Iraqi forces declining to become involved in actions against other Iraqis in Fallujah to appreciate how difficult it is to constitute the kind of ethos which ultimately sustains new armed forces. A fourth challenge is that of dealing with spoilers. One of the tragedies of transition processes is that it's much cheaper and easier to be a spoiler than it is to be a builder. We had a politician in Australia once who commented, if you can't run a meeting, wreck it. <laughs> which I found in a university to be a very useful strategy, actually, uh, but which also uh, is, provides the underlying logic of spoiling in transition processes. Uh, it is all too easy for groups that feel that their interests will be compromised by the reconstitution of the state or the re-establishment of stable democratic politics to take steps that will compromise the process that, it, that, that are supposed to lead that particular outcome. And this becomes a really challenging dilemma when uh, one sees spoilers uh, being sustained by profits from illicit economic activities such as the cultivation of opium. And there's a real confluence of influence between political spoilers and those engaging in illicit economic activities who both have an interest perhaps differently grounded but nonetheless uh, very much uh, in the same avenues in preventing the constitution of an effective set of state instrumentalities that can interfere with their activities. 
A fifth challenge is that of dealing with a region which is irredeemably hostile. Uh, some years ago, uh, a group of academics working on in Afghanistan, myself, Barnett Rubin, Ashraf Rani, Olivier Wa, and Ahmed Rashid, published a short paper with the Swiss Peace Foundation which argued that when one is addressing Afghanistan's problems, one needs almost invariably to set those problems in a wider regional framework. Since uh, South and West Asia are widely troubled areas in which interlocking security dilemmas mean that an attempt to address simply one aspect of a wider regional problem will likely unravel because there are broader dimensions of the problem that a focused approach does not address. Thus, in the long run, in order to stabilise Afghanistan, it's necessary also to pay attention to relations between India and Pakistan, to relations between Pakistan and Iran, to relations between the Central Asian republics and Pakistan, and locate Afghanistan's problem in a realistic context, rather than live with the belief that <coughs> Afghanistan can be isolated <coughs> from a region which, um, ever since the partition of the subcontinent, has intruded into Afghanistan's affairs in a way that may not be to the liking of Afghan politicians, but which nonetheless has had major effects on domestic <coughs> politics in Afghanistan and is likely to continue to do so for some considerable period of time. Finally, Afghanistan faces the long-term challenge of retaining the interests of the wider world. Unfortunately, for at least two years, Iraq has now been a major distraction of attention from uh, Afghanistan. This has received much comment in this town since the publication of uh, Richard Clark's new book, but it's been of interest to specialists on Afghanistan for much the same period. Um, in, uh, shortly after the Bonn Agreement, I made the comment that Afghanistan was on the front pages of the newspapers, but it would soon be off, of, off the front pages. Uh, and Afghanistan is but one competitor for attention in uh, a world which is troubled and in which the agenda of politics is, uh, is uh, cluttered with many different issues. Now, this becomes really pertinent when one looks at the flow of resources for Afghanistan. Uh, if one looks at the supplementary appropriation bill uh, that went through Congress um, late last year, I think now November 2003, the amount of money for reconstruction targeted for Iraq greatly exceeded the amount that was being uh, uh, appropriated for use uh, in Afghanistan, something like $18 billion. In the recent Berlin conference, the Afghan government presented a very carefully documented case for the provision of $27.4 billion over uh, a seven-year period, not to turn Afghanistan into a prosperous country, but simply to lift it to the level of what uh, Finance Minister Rani refers to as dignified poverty. The amount actually pledged at uh, the Berlin conference fell far short of that, just uh, over $8 billion. Now, this is important not simply in terms of the resources available to the Afghan government, but also in terms of the signal that it is, that is thereby sent to Afghan political actors. If the flow of resources to Afghanistan is much lower than the resources to comparable countries ex which have experienced severe disruption, the message that potential spoilers in Afghanistan can take away is that the attention of the wider world is drifting seriously. And that gives them an interest not in adjusting their modes of behaviour to more constructive ones, but rather in hanging onto their weaponry uh, so that they are well protected for the point when the international community walks away altogether. Now, this is not to say that the international community, in that loose sense, does intend to walk away from Afghanistan, but the messages that are conveyed by the uh, willingness of the wider world to provide resources are important. In conclusion, there are no quick and easy solutions to the kind of problems which Afghanistan faces. Uh, elections do not provide uh, an exit option or an exit strategy. They simply form one stage in a much longer term and much more complex process of transition in which one tries to carry a war-torn society from uh, high-level disruption to um, sustainability in the economic and the social and the political institutional realm. Um, it's not the case that when a new government is constituted by an electoral process, this means that it is time 
uh, to move on. On the contrary, this is very often the case, uh, the situation in which a new uh, regime needs all the help it can get, and I certainly hope that Afghanistan uh, will receive, uh, after September, the attention that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We turn now to Thomas Barfield. Um, those of you who are in the back, we have a handful of empty seats uh, up here in front. Uh, our students uh, don't like to come to the front, but I invite you to come to the front because here the seats are. Uh, Tom? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll be speaking today on the role of a radical poli political Islam in an Afghan context, but following up on what Professor Mali has mentioned, I'm going to make what might sound a counterintuitive case because we assume, and the Afghans themselves assume, that there's no more Islamic country than Afghanistan, including Saudi Arabia, according to the Afghans. But that because of that, radical Islam should have fertile grounds for recruitment in Afghanistan. And what I'd like to argue that is, in fact, if we look at any type of radical ideology in Afghanistan, be it Islamism or socialism, that what we tend to see is that this is largely supported from the outside, as Professor Mali has said. That is, if we look at who were, who were the pushers of radical modernism, well, it was the Soviet Union. And if we had looked at 1978, would it be, would we have been correct to say that there's a radical revolution, a sour revolution that's leading Afghanistan into a socialist future? Not too many people <coughs> believe that. But we tend to believe that without too much pushing, Afghanistan could easily become a radical Islamic state. Because we say, look, the Taliban were just there. They had to be thrown out military. Al-Qaeda was there. But if we look at both of those political movements, we find that both of their source of revenue and their ideologies were foreign. And the Taliban, largely from Pakistani madrasas, and Al-Qaeda, largely Arab Gulf states and Wahhabism. The fact is that neither of them had very deep or profound roots in Afghan cultural history, and in fact, really went against the norms of the way Afghans historically have seen Islam. And what I'll argue is that political Islam, as well as radical socialism, or any type of ideology, and we must be careful ourselves in discussing international uh, ideologies uh, in the Constitution and others that we are currently pushing, often don't go over very well in Afghanistan because the Afghans are not fond of any ideology, at least permanent ideology. One of the most striking factors of looking at any of the leaders in Afghanistan today or their factions is how many times they've not only switched sides but switched ideologies. The radical Khalqis cut a deal with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, try to bring down the Parchamese, fail, become Mujahideen, become Mujahideen allied against the Northern Alliance, get defeated by the Taliban, become communists with beards who run the tank corps, and then disappear. But do they disappear? No, because we're told, look at all those Parchamese that are part of the Northern Alliance. How did they get there? Weren't they blood enemies? Weren't it communists versus Islam? How can these people move apart and come together? And one of the reasons I'll argue this is the case is that ideology or Afghan, Afghan political ideology is almost an oxymoron. That is not how politics are done in Afghanistan. They're done on personal interest, ethnic interest, tribal interest, economic interest. Ideology tends to be a cover for these interests, not the guiding force. Many of their backers, their supporters, that is the guiding force. And almost all supporters of any ideology in Afghanistan feel betrayed over time, whether they're communist, Islamist, or Pakistanis. At some point, the Afghans reveal themselves to be Afghans. And when push comes to shove, say goodbye to your ideology, whatever it is. One of the reasons for this, and if we look at Islam in particular, I would argue that Islam in Afghanistan represents something that's largely been lost from the greater Islamic world. That is, Islam in Afghanistan is not an ideology, not an ideology as we understand it, but Islam is still a way of life in Afghanistan. So that political developments there as regards Islam take a quite different course than in neighboring states. Uh, what I mean by Islam as a way of life? Well, what I mean by that is in Afghanistan, historically and particularly in the rural areas, 
Islam is integrated into all aspects of everyday life. Nothing is separate from religion. Businesses, what kind of agreement after a hard bargaining and people are a little bit hot under the collar? Somebody says, pray over this deal. Put the money between your hands. Let's bring religion into this. When a mediator is stuck and two sides will not come to any kind of agreement, the mediator says, in the name of God, think of this. Well, I hate his guts, but God's a different story. I think we can come to an agreement. It's a way of lubricating things. It's a way of making things happen. It does ethics. It does social relations. Therefore, it is extremely hard in Afghanistan for people to conceive of a separation of the state from religion. Because how can you cut out a portion, sort of the body politic, po polish it up, and declare that there's going to be a relationship between this single aspect of life, like politics, and something that's believed to encompass politics, that is religion. So what we've got in, in a situation here, it, it's people often, and even today, still describe Afghanistan when they visit. They say, Afghanistan is a very medieval place. They often mean that physically. They see donkeys, they see mud huts. They say, this is medieval, meaning medieval meaning slash biblical. It all gets sort of mixed together. But in one sense, they are, they are righter than they know because this is a society that must have been how medieval Europe was like when Christianity dominated everything, when the pope could put a country under interdict and an emperor would come crawling across the Alps to get put out of it, when religion could not be separated from the state. We, we are children of the Enlightenment such that we think it's natural that you could put out and take apart religious institutions from political institutions. We have lived with that. The United States Constitution enshrines it. But in a place like Afghanistan, this is not perceived of as possible, even intellectually possible. Therefore, when the Afghans proclaim that contemporary Afghanistan is an Islamic government, not only an Islamic government, but an Islamic republic. People ask many questions. They said, well, how is that similar to the Islamic Republic of Iran? How does that look, can compare to the Islamic parties in Pakistan? But in fact, the common agreement without any debate that Afghanistan should be an Islamic Republic had very little to do with ideology, but with a very different conception of how Afghans saw any legitimate government. That is, an Islamic republic, an Islamic government, is one that is composed of good Muslims, not one that has a particular religious agenda, and particularly not one that defines or enforces a specific variety of Islamic practice. There was no debate that Afghanistan should be an Islamic republic, an Islamic nation, but people were careful not to say what kind of Islam. And in fact, one of the most interesting parts of the new constitution that was just adopted was the recognition of Shia jurisprudence for the first time to go along with uh, Sunni Hanafi, that both would be recognized. And one observer was asking Shias in particular, who was saying, we must have this recognition. And she asked, well, how does it differ? And you know, they didn't know. There are differences, <coughs> but they didn't know. The Hazaras in particular said, this gives us recognition. This gives us rights. Whether there's any difference between those two varieties of Islamic law was not the point. The point is that all aspects of Islam in Afghanistan were to be represented. Indeed, I would argue that freedom of religion in Afghanistan means the freedom of all Islamic sects to practice freely. It is not quite our idea, a Western idea, of freedom of religion in which religion is an individual choice. Because I doubt you could find a quorum of Afghans who would agree that apostasy should not be a crime. And if you're a missionary planning to go to Afghanistan, even under the new constitution, expect to be deported, only this time quietly. Um, all Afghans agree that Muslims have no business changing their religion. But among all Muslims, we have a right to practice freely. For Afghanistan, this is an enormous step forward. For the international community, this may not look good enough. This doesn't get down to what we consider the most important, to be the freedom of the individual. But we have to understand, if Islam is perceived of as a way of life, then a constitution that says that all Muslims have the right to practice Islam as they see fit is an enormous step forward and something that has great cultural resonance within both rural and urban Afghanistan.
Islam is an ideology, on the other hand, which is really what we mean by radical Islam, because it's, it's taking Islam and just using parts of it as a political ideology. Political Islam, as a radical ideology, tends not to arise in places like Afghanistan, in which Islam is perceived as part of everyday life. Rather, these movements tend to arise when societies are under challenge, particularly under challenge to their cultural identity. Not surprisingly, they arise in places that have had a colonial history when the question of who we are, what is our political rights, who are, what is our culture, comes to be a political issue. It occurs in countries like Iran that underwent uh, a, a tremendous amount of rapid economic change. And the question is, where are we going? What are we going to do? Or when populations feel politically vulnerable and turn to religion as an answer. Proponents pushing radical Islam argue that Islam is the way, Islam is the solution, because we are doing something wrong, and we, the radical politicians, have a brand of religion which will correct it. We saw this in the Iranian Revolution. We see it with the religious parties in, in Pakistan. We saw it as the Taliban. One of the most striking examples of this, I would argue, can be seen in radical Islam's view of jihad versus the Afghan view of jihad. For radical Islamists, such as members of al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, but not certainly restricted to him, jihad is, is a universal conflict. It's not fighting in one place or one problem. It involves the entire Islamic community. But for Afghans, fighting the jihad was very specific. It was jihad in one country. It was jihad to get rid of the Soviets. When the Soviets were gone, the Afghans won their jihad. And interestingly enough, although al-Qaeda set up training bases in Afghanistan and recruited very heavily, and the Taliban recruited very heavily, how many Afghans do we find on the membership rolls of al-Qaeda? Practically none. When we read about suicide bombers, how many Afghans are involved? Practically none. Because the Afghan style of jihad was, as Patton said, let the other guy die for his country, or belief. Uh, in this type of jihad, martyrdom is a consolation prize, not something that you, you seek out. And this goes all the way back even to the anti-Soviet war, when the Arabs said, hey, we'll do a few suicide bombs in Kabul. That'll scare the Russians. The Afghan said, that's, that's no way to fight a war. That's no way to conduct a struggle. There's a strong difference in sort of the international jihadists and how they see themselves and how they see struggle with the outside world and the Afghans. As far as the Afghans have been concerned, the whole question is fighting for the freedom of Afghanistan itself. Will they support struggles among other Islamic peoples? Yes. Will they participate in such struggles? Rarely. After all, the Afghans said, we want our own jihad. You win yours. Uh, so if we look at this to some extent, this goes back to a real cultural strong cultural identity that I would argue, despite 25 years of warfare, uh, that Afghanistan remains remarkably secure in its cultural identity, and perhaps even a bit too secure, uh, because they tend to see themselves as superior to all of their neighbors, certainly to heretical Iranians or Shiites, certainly to Uzbeks and Tajiks to the north who allow themselves to be dominated by the Soviets, or to Pakistanis, who are recent converts to Islam half a millennium, you know, it's hardly enough time to shake off Hinduism. But if you ask Afghans, was Afghanistan conquered and converted to Islam? Never. It was only an accident. Some people over tea will tell you that the prophet arrived in Arabia instead of Afghanistan. He must have taken the wrong route. Now, that is truly heretical, particularly from an Arabian point of view. But from the Afghan point of view, when they heard about the religion of Islam, they converted. They were not forced to convert. They are one of the original Islamic groups. And that sense of identity, that sense of cultural identity is extremely strong. And I would argue that it makes them much more difficult to bring into a radical Islamic camp than to people who are coming out of societies that are more fractured, like Pakistan, where the whole question is, what makes the difference between a Pakistani Muslim and an Indian Muslim? What makes you so different? Because you've justified your state, a separate state, because you're Muslim, and yet even more Muslims live in India. How do you reconcile that? The Afghans don't need to reconcile that. They were born Muslims. So if they don't do their prayers five times a day, if they miss a few meals during, or should be opposite, take a few meals during Ramadan, you're still not going to fundamentally alter somebody's identity 
as a Muslim, particularly as a politician. Because in general, and this is where both al-Qaeda and, and the Taliban had difficulty, it is Afghans historically and culturally are unwilling to cede to others the definition of what is Islamic. One great example of this, not a particularly pleasant one, what was when the, when the Taliban were blowing up the Bamiyan Buddhists and a whole set of clerics came from Al-Azhar University in Cairo and they told them chapter and verse why you do not need to do this. And the Taliban told them to get lost, we're going to do it. And they got back, they said these people are incredibly ignorant. Not only do they not know Islamic law, they don't read Arabic and worse, they don't listen to people who know better. <laughs> we know better and they didn't care. They said we didn't care. Now, that was Mullah Omar, but I'd also seen this among shepherds that I worked with, who would contradict a mullah to his face that, no, it was a question one time when a man claimed that a man could have six wives instead of four wives, and mullah told him no. Was, the shepherd just said, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and could not convince him otherwise. He says, I've, I've heard of some people that do. He finally came up with an exception. He said, well, you know there's a jihad exception, that uh, Afghans are allowed to have two more wives than other Muslim people because of jihad. The mullah practically choked because there is no jihad exception. But nevertheless, you know, th this kind of, of sitting around arguing about Islam, even though you don't necessarily know very much about it, I found to be very, very common with, with nomads. People would love to do this, but what, what made this so difficult if you're a religious leader is that you don't have very much authority. It's much better when you have, a, you know, the Pope can speak ex cathedra. No Afghan cleric can command another Afghan to believe the way he does. This makes it very difficult to impose a radical Islam, as both uh, the Taliban and the Al Qaeda uh, found out. Because in general, historically, uh, Afghans have seen themselves as the arbiters of Islam, that whatever they do is Islamic because they are good Muslims. And anyone that's traveled in Afghanistan will know that the varieties of Islamic practices, not just Sunni and Shia, but even within the Sunni community, are quite, quite large. The number, of, uh, um, the number of Sufi orders, the number of shrines of saints, uh, quite a number of things that Wahhabis certainly object to. But the Afghans say, this is our Islam. Just because you come from Arabia doesn't give you the right to tell us what is or is not Islam. But perhaps the greatest difficulty of any kind of radical religious movement in Afghanistan is that religion has almost never been the key factor in Afghan politics. It's, it may have been one of the key excuses, it may have been one of the key themes, particularly because Islam, as Ibn Khaldun pointed out in the uh, 13th century, 14th century, is that religion is quite good for overcoming tribal and ethnic differences. In the name of God, let us unite together. And we may unite together, but the question is, are we doing it in the name of Islam, or is Islam a way to overcome the differences uh, between us? So it's particularly useful as a way to gather people that are divided by tribal lines, ethnic lines, regional differences, to use religion as a way to pull people together. But when we scratch beneath the surface of that, what we generally discover is that practically all political movements in Afghanistan, or regional movements in Afghanistan, tend to be organized, even <coughs> if they're organized in the name of religion, they tend not to be ultimately about religion. That is, if we look at the number of rebellions in Afghanistan, for example, against Amanullah's uh, reforms in the 1920s, which were very often the excuse was they go against Islam, but if we actually look at what they also went against, they, they, they included such things as conscription and taxes. Now me, perhaps, because I live in Massachusetts, next door in New Hampshire, you can have a revolt on the issue of taxation alone. Their license plate says, live free or die. Of course, when they want to live, they drive to our state to use their hospitals, but we allow them to come. Um, but in most places, you can't have such a naked economic political argument that we're going to revolt because we don't want to pay taxes and we don't want to be conscripting. But by God, we're going to stand up for the name of religion, and we're not going to pay taxes. <laughs> so what we tend to see is in the 1920s and others that religion can unite people, but that wasn't the only reason that made the move. Similarly, when we saw the movement against the Soviet Union, people were opposed against the Soviet Union. They were opposed to the PDPA, PDPA government. But the reason that that Mujahideen movement was so biased towards Islamic parties was not a choice of the Afghans. 
was the choice of the Pakistanis and who they funded. And then we thought, well, Afghans are nationally Islamic, so they've chosen the most Islamic parties. The fact is the Afghans weren't given the opportunity to choose their own resistance. They had to work within the international framework of aid that was, was given. And this way to get resources is a particularly important thing when we look at the influence of the Saudis and the Wahhabis, because these were people through the international jihadist network that were giving an awful lot of funds. So sign on to this ideology and you can collect. But it's not really clear how much you really believe. Perhaps the most important thing in terms of looking at these radical political movements is that with the exception of the Taliban, uh, clerics have never ruled in Afghanistan. The Taliban are, are a real exception. In general, the way most Afghan members of the political elite, wherever they come from, they see mullahs or they see the ulama, sort of the Islamic clergy, as having an important but subordinate role in any political system, not a dominant one. If you are a member of the ulama or if you're a radical Islamic cleric, how do you manage to run the system and not be made a subordinate member? One of the ways to do that is to push a radical Islamic movement because then you can get to be in charge of it. However, this is a particularly difficult thing to bring off in Afghanistan because the ideology itself is not really attractive to the bulk of the Afghan people. But if we look at the only group that was really attracted by Taliban ideology, it was largely young Afghans that had been born in Pakistan, precisely that group whose, whose culture, whose politics had been fractured. They were recruited. Older groups of Afghans or Afghans inside Afghanistan were less attracted to this at least as, as a movement. But on the other hand, they only recruited those people because they were sent to Pakistani madrasas. They were inculcated into that. If you grew up in an Afghan village, the career choice of mullah is not an obvious one. <coughs> because as Afghans are aware, mullahs have a great deal of respect in some contexts, but the number of mullah, mullah jokes is also legion. So there's a very ambivalent relationship. One can be highly religious and not necessarily respect religious leaders. This makes it tough to have as the Taliban were, a group of clerics, most of whom have the title mullah, because people got to keep a straight face. You know? And this is not historically what has ruled Afghanistan. Because what has truly been the key to power in Afghanistan, the key to, to pulling people together, is local kinship groups, regional alliances, and sort of self-interest and economic interest that trumps all. And to this extent, then, if we look at radical Islamic movements in Afghanistan, I would argue that probably in, in no other place in the Islamic world is the ideology of these groups less important in Afghanistan and the amount of resources and political power more important. That is, it's what influence Pakistan can derive from funding ex-neo-Taliban, whatever you call them, uh, what Gulf Arabs can do in terms of funding radical Islam. That is, it's, it's the resources they make available to fund particular groups on the ground. Many of the tribes along the Northwest Frontier Province on the Afghan side that are now associated as great supporters of the Taliban were the last to revolt against the PDPA. They took their last payment, killed the Minister of Tribal Affairs, and announced they were Mujahideen. These are people that have moved back and forth. They're also the same people in Waziristan that when they heard the United States was going to bomb uh, Afghanistan to get rid of the Taliban, but only the Taliban, they demanded the Taliban give them a writ that declared Waziristan a, sorry, sorry, Paktia, other side of the border, Paktia, a Taliban-free zone, so they wouldn't be bombed. And as the Taliban pulled their troops out, what was the first thing the people in Paktia did? They began having dances again at their weddings. That is, you're moving back and forth that what you've really got is that ideology over the past 30 years has been a real plague on Afghanistan. We've seen Afghanistan suffer from the worst abuses of radical ideology, from radical socialism to radical Islam. And I would argue with that direct experience on radical anything that any type of radical political movement, if Afghans themselves have a choice, uh, has very little political traction. But as Professor Mali noted, if the international community is not careful and outsiders begin to take the reins, then once again, Afghanistan will become the cockpit for dueling radical political ideologies. Thank you.
Well, I unexpectedly find myself a bit cheered uh, by that presentation, uh, even as uh, I'm rather daunted by the list of challenges that Bill Malley uh, put forward. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Uh, there are table microphones, so I expect that your voices can be heard. Those of you, however, on the sides and in the back, um, oh, do we have hand mics? Oh, we do. Okay, we've got hand mics on both sides. So, uh, let me see a uh, show of hands who'd like to be recognized. Please introduce yourself and keep your comments uh, restricted. Yes, Bill. Yes, you. Got it. Yep, 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 right behind you. Oh, there you are, Wilson. Thank you. I'm Bill Milam from uh, the Wilson Center. Uh, I work with Bob on um, South Asian things. Um, I have two questions, one for Professor Barfield and one for Professor Malley. Professor Barfield, first, um, fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about the Taliban um, not having a real resonance in Afghanistan. At least that's the way I, what I thought you said, if I can use that term resonance for, to mean a whole lot of things. Yet, uh, we keep hearing that the Taliban are protected, supported in some way by the people in southern, uh, southern Afghanistan. My question is, since I assume you are correct, that this has to do more with fear and perhaps resource distribution than with some sort of religious come emotional come political resonance. And second question for you, sir, is if that is true, what about the people in the tribal areas of Pakistan who are also of the same ethnic, generally ethnic persuasion, and how do they feel? If you may not know this, but how do they feel about the Taliban? And if so, why do they seem to be protecting them? Uh, so, and then before I give up the microphone, Professor Malley, um, on the, your list, long list of the challenges of elections, I, I agree with. I've been at several other conferences where the idea of holding elections so quickly has been <laughs> challenged. There are arguments for it that are presented, uh, and these are primarily U.S. government spokesmen that do so in the conferences I've been at, and uh, a number of academics and other observers argue against it, against elections quite so soon. Uh, what would you say, uh, would, uh, I would like your opinion on that, and what do you think is the balance of the argument? Which, uh, which uh, arguments do you accept as more powerful, the idea you can't put these things off because there is a promise and uh, or the idea that uh, which brings into the into effect the challenges you mentioned that these may turn out to be counterproductive. So why don't we turn to you first. Okay. Um, in terms of, of sort of the resonance of the Taliban, one of the things I think that's particularly important to, to note is that although the Taliban portrayed themselves as a religious movement, uh, the vast majority of, of their followers and leaders were Pashtuns. Um, a true religious group would have tried to make itself more pan-ethnic. The, the Taliban never did. As a consequence of that, I do believe that there are a number of Pashtun groups who see that at least as, a, as an alternate way to make sure that there's Pashtun uh, influence, if not dominance in an Afghan government. Certainly, Pakistan's aim was, was to see an Afghan government that was dominated uh, by Pashtuns. I think there's, there, there's a lot of resonance for that. I think there's more resonance for that than there is for the Taliban religious belief. Also, among certain Pashtuns, there's a lot of mixture uh, among the Taliban of, of sort of Wahhabi principles, but also sort of a lot of Pashtun Wali, a certain amount of Pashtun belief. And there's sort of a mix there that uh, appeals to these groups that's n it's not necessarily re re religiously based, but culturally based. Your question about the Northwest frontier, frontier is an excellent one. I actually think as an ideology, uh, the Talibanism, if you will, has more resonance among the Pashtuns of Pakistan than it does in Afghanistan, because I think uh, uh, the whole question of Islam as an ideology uh, is one that uh, is of great import in Pakistan. And the whole question of what kind of Muslims are we, how to create a Muslim nature, a nation. For that reason, I always thought 
Pakistan was playing a very dangerous game in terms of supporting this in Pakistan because the only place a Taliban-style revolution could ever take root, it seemed to me, uh, outside of Afghanistan was Pakistan, not Iran, not Central Asia. Before you start, um, I hate to see people standing up. I know you're reluctant to walk into the front, but come on down. We have a number of seats here. Thank you. Um, the question that Ambassador Milam raises is a very important one. Uh, it's certainly the case that institutionally elections offer one opportunity that virtually no other political institution does, and that is the opportunity to change a government in a peaceful means. Uh, and that <coughs> is very important once political systems have reached a high level of consolidation. But it is by no means the only significant element of a functioning political system. And I think this is where political scientists and government officials often um, take radically different paths. That uh, Political scientists often would argue that it is equally important to develop a framework of institutions of which elections will ultimately be a part, involving uh, some of the classic formulations that political theorists from the time of Montesquieu onwards highlighted, the importance of a separation of powers, the importance of uh, a judicial system in particular, uh, none of which necessarily flow from the holding of elections. Uh, too often, elections can be simply the final part of an exit strategy. That states use the holding of an election as an excuse for saying that a transition has been brought to a conclusion. Now, I think actually this goes back to the Namibia uh, political transition in 1989 uh, when the United Nations Transition Assistance Group successfully um, monitored an election conducted by the South Africans which led to the smooth transition to independence of Namibia uh, in what was, for the most part, an incredibly successful exercise. Uh, it was not sufficiently noticed at the time that one of the reasons it succeeded was that the outcome of the elections fell within the broad expectations of the different parties. SWAPO expected to win, the Democratic Turnhalla Alliance did not expect to win, but it did expect to win enough votes to deny SWAPO two-thirds majority in the Constituent Assembly and therefore the ability to write its own constitution. Uh, and thus, rather than being seen as an exceptional case, uh, the Namibia case came to be viewed as a model of how elections should be built into transition processes. And there was not enough attention paid to the peculiarities of that particular case, which meant that importing it into other areas of activity where there were very different uh, configurations of forces, um, very different expectations on the part of the, the relevant parties, uh, could come into play. Ultimately, one needs political arrangements that resonate with the expectations of both political elites and the mass population in a society. If there's a major gulf between what either powerful members of an elite expect or what the bulk of the society expect, then new arrangements will not stick. Uh, holding an election doesn't guarantee a democratic political culture. It doesn't guarantee a consensually unified political elite. If it's, if it's part of a process of done, designing new institutions, it doesn't guarantee that they'll be well designed, nor does it guarantee that they'll take root. New institutions move through infancy into adolescence and then into maturity. The danger, I think, of having elections prematurely is that they can stress a system that has not itself developed the degree of institutional integrity to survive those sorts of stresses. And uh, maybe the society will sort of muddle on after the election is held, but there's a significant opportunity cost in terms of chances of building trust between parties that may be lost in the process. And that, that's why if I had been a participant at the bond meeting, I would have warned very <coughs> strongly against having elections any time soon. Not against having elections as an ultimate objective, but rather as having them
flowing as a natural part of a process of political reconciliation rather than as a hard deadline within uh, a timetable crafted before one could possibly know whether the relations between the parties at the time of the election would be sufficiently amicable that they would be uh, a constructive rather than a destructive exercise. Bill Royce. Got a question? Got a mic coming, Bill. Bill Royce, Voice of America, question first for Barfield, second for Malley. Um, for Dr. Barfield, are there any areas where Afghan Islam overlaps radical Islam? Um, actually, I, I would argue that, that no, in part because of religious leaders in Afghanistan usually left the country for training. One of the interesting things is there's no great centers of Islamic learning inside Afghanistan, but it's not surprising. You go to Iran, Iraq, uh, Bukhara in Central Asia, or Delhi in India, or Pakistan. So it's, if you look even at, well, where has the ideology come from, from leaders in Afghanistan who formed it, um, it's almost always come from the outside. Rabbani picked up his, his in Cairo, Sayaf in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the communists picked it up in New York City. So, uh, in general, um, you know, alien ideologies uh, have come uh, from, from elsewhere. How about education of women, some of the women-related issues? I think there, you, what, you, what you have is, is uh, a confusion very often between the cultural and, and the religious, um, is that when the Taliban or other religious conservatives are against women's education, they try to justify it on the basis of religion. The resonance of that is not religious, but cultural. That is, you're dealing with a gendered, segregated society, but one that's quite different, people forget, between the city and the countryside, or even age. Uh, older women in Afghanistan often play a very, very public role. Nomad women, I doubt, even under the Taliban were put under a, a veil. There's sort of uh, cultural expectations of what is and is not po possible, and very often radical groups give this a, a religious explanation, but what they're really appealing to is, is a cultural conservatism. Okay, Bill, let me, let me uh, jump in. A lot of people have their hands. Um, okay, but a real quick yeah. one for Melly. How about a, the, the next time around? Let me, let me recognize okay. another page. No, pass it right to the gentleman on your right. Uh, Saeed Isha from the Voice of America. So it is really reassuring that uh, Professor Mali and uh, Professor Barfield touch upon some very important points which is really missing in the presentations of mostly Western scholars because Western concepts are far away from what is happening inside Afghanistan. So I, I'm very much delighted uh, by this presentation. My question to Professor Barfield is, if this process which is going on under Bonn uh, agreement fails in Afghanistan to satisfy the majority of the people of Afghanistan and the transitional authority with the assistance of the international community fails to rebuild Afghanistan institutionally and also pave the way for democracy. And as you mentioned, the repeated interference of the Pakistani clergy, military and their military intelligence in Afghanistan plus the Iranian interference in Afghanistan, what will happen? How do you visualize the future of this much fractured Afghanistan? Thank you very much. Well, I think I would say as Afghans do, God forbid that just such a thing should happen. Um, I think the, the power vacuum would, would once again lay Afghanistan open to its neighbors. And as you've mentioned, um, pretty much all the neighbors can have some guilty hands in, in this. What I think is, is perhaps most important uh, is, to, is to focus on building what you might call indigenous institutions in Afghanistan, where Afghanistan is strong. And I think one of the most important things is to try to bring, break the link between the, a lot of leaders um, who are riding on their reputation of, of the anti-Soviet jihad uh, but have little to offer to Afghanistan. There's a new generation, there's new issues, and um, almost all of the old leadership of whatever political stripe is compromised, uh, I would hope that the international community would make an opportunity for, for new leadership 
to arise that would, would focus on inside Afghanistan. But I think the most important thing the international community can do is provide Afghanistan enough breathing room so that it, it can redevelop its own political structures. It is ex incredibly vulnerable right now to the interference of, of outsiders. Jesus, of whether Afghanistan is really ready at this point for a national government, not just an election to choose one, but whether in fact the building of indigenous institutions isn't much more of a local and regional phenomenon, and we're, we're reaching for the wrong goal. We should be thinking of Afghanistan as groups of people and working toward that end rather than assuming it. I have a lot of sympathy for that view, actually. Uh, during the period when the state uh, as a collection of institutions was undergoing substantial collapse, uh, social order in Afghanistan to a significant degree depended upon the functioning of legitimate social institutions at the local level, which could be incredibly powerful. Uh, not just um, institutions uh, for the resolution of conflict at the local level, but also institutions such as market relations, uh, which remained dominant modes of economic distribution in Afghanistan. The difficulty, I think, is that Afghanistan is located in an international system which demands <coughs> a particular set of institutional arrangements as a criterion for basic membership of the international system. There's a demand for the state that comes from outside. And it's very difficult. It's not impossible, as Somalia shows, but it's very difficult for um, a country to function within this wider world if certain basic institutional demands generated by that system are not met. So in that sense, I think it's not surprising that the Bonn process focused on the reconstitution of state instrumentalities. And part of the difficulty is that legitimate local institutions of governance are not necessarily um, building blocks that will neatly slot into the process of building the state in this wider sense of the term, since uh, the modern state is very much premised on the existence of bureaucracy. And I think the, the, one of the dangers in Afghanistan at the moment is to get the worst of both worlds, that one ends up with a dysfunctional but substantial bureaucracy at the central level which simply becomes yet another extractive actor rather than something contributing to the well-being of people at the local level. One needs to guard against that, I think. Um, I, I would just say that I think one of the, when people say, does Afghanistan have a sense of nationhood, that one of the most interesting things is that none of the factions has ever threatened its rivals with breaking away, becoming independent, etc. And one of the reasons for this is I think they understand actually as Professor Malley was saying, that the national government's most important role is to deal for Afghanistan with the outside world. And these are two separate features. And historically, <clears throat> the modus vivendi has been to let the local communities do what they want, but to guarantee peace, and to deal with the outside world, and to redistribute resources that come from the outside world. One of the, the reasons that the government is failing in this is that be, the way that we're giving out the aid is such that one of the ways Afghan central governments have regained power is by having a monopoly control on outside resources to the extent that local powers don't need the central government, it loses a lot of its props. But there's, I think, agreement on all Afghan factions. Even if you're someone like Ishmael Khan dealing with Iran, it's good to have a national government to say, I'd love to go a step further, but I really can't. Uh, so that there's a lot of support for a central government, but our idea that that central government is based on the bottom up, I think, is a misunderstanding. It has a particular job, uh, and that's to represent and protect Afghanistan's interest in the international community. Thanks. We've been joined by uh, Ambassador uh, Juwad. Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a good discussion so far, and in some respects, at any rate, an encouraging discussion. So. Uh, if it's all right with you, we'd like to continue this for about 15 more minutes, and then we will uh, turn things over to you. Atik. Atik Sarwani, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Molly. Uh, Professor Molly, some observer uh, point uh, out to the discrepancy 
between the nature of the Afghan state as it is being reconstituted at the time and the nature, fragmented nature of Afghan society. You have a strong presidential system on one side, and you have fragmented society in terms of regional power, ethnic the, the division, and so on. And something in the long run, this may not be the nature, highly central, centralized government may not accommodate the nature of an Afghan, the fragmented nature of Afghan society. I wonder what do you think about that? There are actually two separate questions to which that gives rise. One is the question of what should be the range of functions in which a central government engages. And there I think there is an argument in favour of the central government doing a few things well rather than trying to do a lot of things badly. Uh, and that is always a challenge in transitional processes of this sort because encouraging new political leaders to relinquish areas of activity rather than claim them as their own um, is, is difficult. Broad, uh, more broadly, I think you, you point to a serious issue relating to the content of the new constitution, which is that presidential systems tend to be seen in fragmented societies as producing one winner and many losers. And one of the reasons why various political scientists have argued for parliamentary systems is that they create a multiplicity of places in the sun, as it were. That where one has a parliamentary system with a reasonable amount of strength, then a range of political actors from different social backgrounds may all feel that they have a significant role to play within the political system and therefore have a stake in making the political system work rather than contesting the political system. Uh, and that's a little harder to do in, in presidential systems where many people at the end of the day can see themselves as, as losers. I, I myself see an argument in deeply divided societies in having very large parliaments which act as a kind of sponge to soak up the potential spoilers rather than having political systems which will incline the spoilers to be spoilers. Uh, I think there's also a danger in looking at political systems in, as bases for the operation of a particular given individual. And I think a lot of people have looked at the new Afghan constitution very positively because they have very positive feelings towards President Karzai. But in the long run, one needs to be thinking about how a system will function when a given occupant is no longer on the scene. Constitutions, after all, are texts for the long run rather than the short run. Now, I can remember oh, 20 years ago, being at a, more than 20 years ago, being at a seminar in uh, Australia the day after uh, Bashir Jimael, the, the uh, new Lebanese uh, president had been assassinated and someone in the audience was saying what Lebanon needs is a strong leader and after a while the Lebanese ambassador finally said 20 pounds of high explosive can get rid of a strong leader. And that is a salutary warning that when one looks at constitutions one needs to be thinking not just of the here and now but also of the long term and the way in which politics may be constituted by a particular form of constitutional arrangement when the people with whom one feels comfortable at present, at present are no longer political actors and a very different set of individuals with possibly very different approaches to politics may be on the scene. Deepa, I saw you next. Deepa Lovely from George Washington University. Deepa, let us bring the microphone please. Deepa Lovely from George Washington University. My question is for Tom Barfield. Uh, Tom, I think most Afghans that I've spoken to would agree entirely with your representation of how the religious distortions took place as coming from outside. But having said that, when you look at some of the trends today, how do we explain mm -hmm. the fact that um, the when you look at, say, if it's politi uh, emergence of new political parties organizing, it seems as if the more conservatives have the upper hand, or at least it appears that way, 
that would be the same case in, say, the organization of the judiciary as well. So how do you explain the lingering of these um, sort of, I, I wouldn't say extremism, but more conservative elements over what I completely agree is a, is a more progressive and liberal tradition of the past? I, I believe one of the reasons for that is that the way the war ended, um, the Taliban were run out of town as a movement, but a lot of the people they appointed remained in office, particularly in the court system and others. So the whole question of who was to serve um, and what kind of government there was sort of actually the people who had the advantage on the ground, who had been organized through the anti-Soviet period and beyond, were largely the conservative religious groups because the, the other groups really had very little patronage and, uh, and it was very difficult for them to get established inside Afghanistan in part because the people who represented, well for two things, partly the, the people who could best represent those groups were no longer in Afghanistan. They were in Europe or the United States. Or, and I think uh, uh, one of the things the conservatives have used very effectively, is they blame everything on the communist. That everything that uh, we would consider uh, more or less in terms of human rights standards or international standards, they're able to say, well, you know, that, that's really a how key belief. And they're able to play this communist card, although the irony is we have no Soviet Union, we have no communist, but the, the, the resonance of this is such um, that they're able to put these other parties on the defensive that, you know, uh, well, we see that in the United States too, I suppose, it's not that unusual. Um, but I do think it's because, um, in, in part, the, the people that we, we might consider on the more liberal side in Afghanistan were more urban based and therefore have a tougher time reaching out to a rural constituency. The religious people have always been there, so they sort of have a head start. But I think what a more liberal faction needs to do is to stress Afghan values. I think that's the way to, you know, to bring people. We're not in opposition. We are the sort of the, the, the leaders of, of an Afghan cultural tradition, of an Afghan religion, and it's these people, you know, who are on the fringes. But they've got a lot of catching up to do. I'm Jennifer Noyant from the State Department. Uh, my question is for both of you. and. Um, I'm, I'm going off, um, uh, taking off on the point of, of Tom, what you were saying about the Taliban sort of being an anomaly in Afghanistan, and I, I fully understand, uh, you know, and 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 I do share a lot of what you're saying, but I have a question about that, and that is that the Taliban was, were such an anomaly, and yet, well, how was it that they were able to? bring order to that very, very chaotic society to the point that's always struck me as being able to, you know, make sure that people's beards were of a certain length and, and make sure they didn't have a television and so on and so forth. Um, and there wasn't, um, <coughs> despite the fact that the Afghans are a very, very independent people, uh, there wasn't much of a rebellion against that. It wasn't a feeling, well, we don't have to do this just because you tell us to. Um, and I know that they were armed, but at the same time, lots of people are armed in Afghanistan. And we now have a situation where we have uh, sort of, a, and, and, and the, I think the, the opium question is, is one that really stands out in my mind because they, as far as I understand it, they, they used a, a combination of persuasion and coercion and not a whole lot else um, to really bring the opium production down to almost zero. Whereas now we have a situation in transition where, uh, you know, we're trying to bring as much to bear as we can to to see a more orderly emergence of a society, to to see, you know, um, not a not an extremist form of, of government or society, but one that's livable for everyone. And yet, it seems to be a, a really hard um, transition to make. And I'm wondering why is it that the Taliban then were able to do this if they are still considered as outsiders, and people now are are having such a hard time. Well, I would would probably argue that extremists of any variety have more, a, a greater ease of, of bringing order to a place 
uh, simply because they won't brook any excuses, whether that was mm -hmm. the, you know, the communist or, or the Taliban. They were willing to use what force it took. But I think the main difference on the Taliban is that you didn't have, as you do now, sort of auto autonomous militia under them. When they gave an order, they had some troops that could go out and carry it out. Um, and that one of the difficulties now is the central government can give orders, but in, in the regions it really doesn't have the capacity uh, uh, to put it together. Um, I'm not altogether, in terms of resistance, um, you have to remember that when they first took Mazar Sharif, um, they lost 3,000 people in a revolt. Um, the whole question of whether they could have maintained themselves over time is, is one that I'm not, well, we'll never, we'll never really know. But one of the most interesting things about the Taliban, which did make them weak, is they never transformed themselves from a movement into a government. That was always their weakness. And when it came down to administration, uh, the guys who were running the government in Kabul never knew what the decision makers in Kandahar wanted to do. So in some, some ways, um, they never even got to the stage of forming a government. They never took responsibility for government administration, which is why, as much as they hated the UN, they never threw them out because the UN was doing a lot of humanitarian assistance, the governance uh, that was keeping the Afghan people from starving. And I do think, I mean, you know, as, as a historian once told me, he says, when, when you see a lot of historical records about punishments for something, it's probably an indication that people are disobeying, not they're obeying. When you see silence, it's probably an indication they're obeying. The number of times that um, the Taliban told people not to watch the Titanic on video and that all Western Beatles styles haircuts and other things would be banned. The fact that you, know, you can spot somebody with a, with, a, with a shaved face or a cut beard and that they were punishing these people on a regular basis I think shows that while there may not have been revolts against them, that particularly in Kabul and Mazar and some other places, that the degree of a cooperation they were getting was certainly you know, not what, what they were expecting. In other words, they, you were not getting the transition, this became regularized, that people would do this. And even in the countryside, I had, you know, people complaining, these were people that wore beards, they didn't like wearing long beards. They weren't willing to revolt over that, but they really thought it was nobody's business, that that's what these guys were doing. And what really comes up is that when, it's, when people feel that way, and the UN and the Northern Alliance went against them, how quickly they collapsed. That is, there was nobody really willing to stand behind them when it looked it was going, going the other way. That's where I feel they, they were unsuccessful. They could get some certain policies done, but were not successful in, in rooting themselves in a way that would even allow them to, you know, to survive. Bill, we'll give you the last word. Thank you. Very briefly, uh, I, the question of the Jennifer's raised is a very interesting and important one, I think. Uh, I, I agree with what um, Tom has said. Uh, two points. One is that the Taliban, in addressing the question of order and addressing specifically the issue of opium cultivation, were prepared to use tactics that would simply be unacceptable given the wider range of human rights norms in which a country like <coughs> Afghanistan is now nested as part of the transition process. And in, in, uh, there's been a study by <coughs> British criminologists recently which has highlighted this, that their success in, in dealing with opium cultivation was a product of the tactics that they were prepared to use. That, uh, I think another point which is relevant here is that the Taliban didn't so much stamp out certain types of um, predatory activity but draw some of the predators within their own ranks and reward them in other ways, which created a spurious impression of the disappearance of, of actors rather than the actual obliteration of forces that had the potential to be predatory. And finally, I think we, can, we need to be alert to just how down and out ordinary Afghans felt during the Taliban period up until uh, the events of September the 11th transformed the, the political environment in Afghanistan as well, that there was a sense that no one was interested anymore, that the Taliban were the only force around, that they had access to externally generated resources that none of their opponents had. So why put one's head up and risk, risk having it chopped off at that particular point? Once it became clear that the balance of forces in the international system had changed in a fundamental way against the Taliban, the number of people who were prepared to, to move against the Taliban internally blossomed. And so in a sense I think it's a reflection of the rationality of people whose individual calculations for much of the Taliban period was that there was no point in standing up individually against the Taliban because it would just be a recipe for being chopped down. But that changed fundamentally um, on one bright 
day in September. Well, thanks to both our speakers, you all have gotten us off to a, a marvelous start this afternoon. Please join me in expressing our thanks to both. Now, if I may ask, uh, you certainly are welcome to stand, but don't uh, vacate the premises, because what I would like to do is simply have Dennis Cooks and the ambassador move right up here. Um, and I'd like Billy to get started in about 60 seconds, so don't go away. <laughs>